let's start with our daily reading. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Young men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters in all purity. Let's stop there. We're going to continue reading in just a few moments. I want to talk about something. We can see this is it, it says instructions for church is the kind of the theme, although that's not actually in the original text. We can see that there's templates that is laid out for certain things like overseers. And we talked about the family unit in the last two uh, chapters in chapter three and chapter number four. In chapter number five, there's a respect that yeah. that that is speaking about in the very beginning. How we treat each other in, in, the, in the church or in the body of Christ rather, which is the church, the actual ecclesia. And we see that for people that are in our, our circles, there should be a respect how we do it. If they're a person who is a younger woman, we can treat them as sisters. But the older women, the women who are older, we should be treating them and talking to them the same way that we talk to our mothers. Do we, are we really disrespectful to our mothers when we in church at home? No, we're not. We're not. We listen to them. We keep an open ear. We also... Uh, we're willing to listen, okay? We keep an open ear. We are, are in, a, in a reverent state. We don't just talk to the mean, but sometimes you have to talk with your head bowed. Uh, sometimes you have to um, be willing to accept or rebuke yourself. The younger men, we treat them as brothers. We treat them, hey, you're a fellow heir. We're going to heaven together, just like the sisters here. And then it says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a, a, a father. Sometimes when it comes to our elderly people, we're really quick to just dismiss, dismiss them as senile. We're, we're quick to just talk down to people. But here it's saying you need to come to it at a different approach. Sometimes there's still a message you need to speak to somebody that's much older than you. But the approach that we by which we go about it is different. It's something like we have to think carefully, choose your words carefully. And it's good that they talk about this in the Bible because many people just are not filtering their words nowadays. Especially as we get to the time, stay and age, where we're on social media and we text whatever we want, right? We're finding that we're not thinking about what we're saying. How many times that people hide behind a screen or filter? How many times do people hide behind these things and then their words become different than we normally would? Now, normally we don't have to talk about this as much, but in today's day and age, there's so much of that gets into a habit. I worked a couple jobs that were online. So I worked customer service online years ago. Yeah, I did. You, you didn't know that? I did. And what I found was that there's like a sense of empowering when you're behind the screen. In fact, there's a new show about it. Not that I recommend it, but there's a show, I think it's on Peacock, called it Anonymous, The Anonymous. And the whole show is a business type of elimination game show. In the show, they shoot the people go into this room and they receive an identity and nobody knows that identity all the identity is just an icon and what happens is in that show is that once they get behind this identity they start playing the game very differently they don't filter their words in real life they're sweet with everybody but behind the scenes they're stabbing each other in the back so that's something you have to know that happens quite a bit people change when we're not filtering our words. So the principle that we can learn from the opening passages is that we should we should approach the people who in our life with a type of filter. And that's a type of love, right? Some people use an excuse that they say, that's just me, that's how I am. And we use this as an excuse to hurt people. We use it as an excuse to not hold back what it is we're thinking. We just say everything we think and we think that's okay. But many times when we're walking in life this way, where we're just vomiting on everybody, we're not demonstrating the reflection of God. We're not demonstrating the reflection of Christ in our life. We're not demonstrating the fruits of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And again, remember what we spoke about earlier in the week about Moses, who himself, when he was called to show the miracle he was called to stretch his staff towards the rock but Moses at that time of his life was just fed up he was tired he was just like I'm done I'm done with this and he hit the rock and caused the water to break to come out now either way whether the rock was split 
by his staff hitting it or by just only by pointing at it and then the, the rock commanding the rock to split it was a, it was just a little staff i mean it was a huge rock by the way they showed where where this actually was in history some of you guys have seen it and you can actually see the water trail there as if it was carved right between and if it was coming out of those that rock and just cut right in half giant stone it's really strange of this rock either way the miracle happened but one had a consequence god said okay fine i'll work through you but there's a consequence to this one because of that he did not reflect the miracle in the prescribed manner that god wanted him to some people are believers in christ some people do the things of god in this way where they're not reflections of christ we do the work of god fine i'll do the ministry i'll preach the sermon i'll say the prophetic word i'll, I'll preach the scripture but we don't come upon it with the correct filter okay we don't come upon it with the correct reflection of christ we're not holding back we're just vomiting on 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 so to speak the word of god we're like how El how i preached the message about elijah and the fire not too long ago he didn't check to see if he should do that and we see that when the disciples took that same manner sitting next to jesus jesus rebuked them not saying they couldn't bring fire from heaven to destroy those people but is that the manner is that how god wants to be reflected and that's also where I preached the message about, the, about Moses hitting the rock. The consequence for Moses was that he couldn't enter the promised land anymore. He, the Bible says that you could see it, but you can't enter it yourself. You ever wonder why Moses led the people 40 years in the wilderness, but he didn't go into the promised land? Yeah, he helped with some of the battle, it says. But he didn't himself go into the wilderness because he wasn't putting that filter on. He was like, I'm done. I just want to, this is how I am, and this is how I'm going to be right now. And he just got mad, and it was a moment of weakness. He wasn't always that way. The Bible says he was the most weak, meek man on the face of the earth. But at that moment, he had a weak moment. The Bible tells us to not be unbecoming. If we find ourselves in positions where we're just using our giftings as if they are our identity, we just say, I have this gift in this area of powerful healing, so I'm just going to walk around as if God's stamp of approval is on me. And you can be operating in God's power, but not God's stamp of approval. And this is uh, something I've ever taught in the, uh, from the John Paul Jackson series, The Art of Hearing God. How many people in the Christian's community are taking their gifts and taking them as if they're identity. As if God approves of everything I say, just because I can prophesy or have prophesied. Everything I'm saying is not, cannot be infallible or perverted. Or everything I do because I can heal or I can walk on water must be coming from God. And people begin to idolize these people, not thinking, hey, we need to filter this through the Word of God. I need to align this up with the Word of God. I need to check because there's a lot of spiritual interpretation, but not a lot of spiritual and spiritual opinions. But there's not always a spiritual truth or sometimes there's more to the story. There's a half truth. There's a partial truth. Even Paul says, we know in part, we prophesy in part, then we'll know fully. I know this personally from a lifetime of working with people who are in the prophetic community. Some of them are my very close friends. And yet, when I've done this, even them, over time, have told me their personal Even them have learned their personal stories of how to say, I have to go to God for everything. Now, this is the theme of the principle for our lives. When we're putting on filters, if you're saying, what filter we should use? The primary filter is love. The next filter we should use, the one Moses used most of his life, humility. Love and humility. Remember what Jesus, the example he gave us. It says that Jesus could look into a person. And it says he did not need the testimony from any man about himself. Some, nobody, that means when people came right up to him and they would say, Hey, I'm such and such from so and such and such place. I'm, I'm so and so from such and such place. And this is my problem. It's, he didn't need that. It says... He knew what was in a man already. It tells us specifically. He knew what was already inside the man. So he can look at you and know all of your problems. He can know all of your faults. And he still love you. Look right in your eyes and he'll still love you. And that's a great filter that we have. Whether we're dealing with issues that we need to deal with or we're believing out our Christian walk, that filter needs to come on. The filter of love. We can't just vomit. We can't just say, God was with me once, so God's going to be with me every time. Or God is with me in this area, so he must approve of everything I do or everything I say. No, my friends, we have to humbly go before God. We always have to remain in the state where we may be fallible, 
with every area of our life. Remember, Paul said it best. If I speak with the tongues and I speak with the if I speak with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, but I have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, no all knowledge. So what if we speak in tongues? So what if we can prophesy as if we are angels themselves who can see in another dimension? So what if we can heal all the sick in the world? But if we don't have that love, we're really nothing at all. I'm going to conclude this message with one more thing. About two years ago, a friend of mine, Superfood, was, you guys all know Superfood from our community. He's, he's been with me since the beginning. And one of the things he had said, there was somebody he followed, and I won't say his name, but it was somebody he followed online who was a Christian. He was a Christian. He said he was a Christian. And he made a lot of accurate biblical calls with certain things. I think it was Intel at that time and maybe some prophetic. But there was a certain attitude by which he was doing it. There was a certain reflection by which he did. And I remember, I, I never watched that person myself, but I always heard it through him, Superfood, and through a few other members of my, in our community. And I remember one time, I think I did hear some of it once, but I remember being very checked in my spirit, grieved in my spirit. I said, this is not a reflection of God, but the gifting is there. Very much anointed men, I'm oh, sorry, gifted men from the Lord, but the reflection of Christ isn't there. And I said, this is what I said to Superfood. And some of you guys were there. You'll remember that I said this live. I said, God won't allow this man to live long upon the earth if he will not change and be a reflection of himself. Because this man is operating Christ, using the gift because he is a follower, because he has followers, but the Lord will not allow him to live long upon the earth. Superfood, are you there? Remember? Are you there? I don't know if you're at work. Okay. And when this happened, I think it was within about three months that it was announced that he had a, a form of a, a rare form of cancer. And then he died not so long after that. From what I understand, it was like within a year. Was that the truth? Superfood? That man? Oh, sorry. You, you're talking about Benny? Uh, I wasn't trying to say Probably. names, but yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he had uh, three, three forms of cancer, actually. Wow. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, now, I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know anything. But I just said, this is, this is something we've, we've observed. Why does God still use then a person who is uh, all anointed? And, and uh, the primary reason is because he's limited in who he can use. For example, if there's a mega church and the pastor is still sinning, or the pastor is sinning in that church, the Lord will still use that man. He'll allow him to continue office, just like he did for King, King Saul. Wicked man, but God still use him. One pastor once said this, the Lord is the only... Uh, one in the whole world who will fire you but let you continue working for them for a long time. It was like another 20 years, I think, after he was fired. Or was it was at 40 years he, he was in, in power. A long time. That's a long time. And, and these, are, these are the things we see. God does these things because he's merciful. As the Bible says, the Lord is not slow in some as you think or consider slow, but rather he is merciful, not wishing any to perish. If God wants to judge the household and judge the father, for example, he will judge the father, but he has to do it in such a way that he doesn't hurt the wife or the son, as we see in the scriptures about the parable of the sow, sowing in the tares. He says, hey, the angel said, hey, there's an enemy that planted tares in your field. Should we pull them out? And God says, no, lest we hurt the good ones with it, lest we pull out the, bad, the good ones with the bad. Instead, let them grow up to the time of judgment. And so God also spoke a similar thing in Revelations when he talked about the cup of wrath. So when we think about God and we think about his judgments, we think about his punishment, the consequence for not filtering his character, not filtering his love as we spoke about today in our passage. What we find is that God is very merciful in this. He will allow that minister, that pastor who's doing that sinning to continue doing the ministry because he cares about the people. Are you seeing what I'm saying? He doesn't want the church to all fall apart just because this one man is sinning. He can deal, he can bring in destruction, but his character is not such that it reflects that. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham said, would you spare it if there was at least 10 righteous? God wasn't saying that the sin was okay. He wasn't saying he wasn't going to destroy the city at all at some time in the future. But at the moment he was saying, but I will spare it for this. So sometimes God does want to deal with a man for their sin, but he's also concerned about all of these people. So that's why sometimes God allows those people to stay in place because he's using them. Who else is he going to use at that moment? 
And even then, if there was a transition, it's very difficult. And so I want you to think about these things. If God's character is that he's merciful in this way, he himself uses his own filter of love. Our first response should be always through the filters, as we highlighted. Now, next time we come back to our scripture, we're going to, we're going to pick up at verse number three and continue on. So thank you for reading our daily reading together with us. Uh, we're about to begin our dive. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the reading of the Word of God. I pray that us, ourselves, our community will be coded in love. And Lord, I pray that we would be a, a community of people who is weighing carefully and choosing carefully our words. That we think twice before moving and reflecting you. Because we always are reflecting you. We just sometimes put you and paint you in a bad light to our own detriment. I pray that you would forgive us our wicked ways. Pray that you would forgive us our sins, that you would be with us and uh, strengthen us. Let us be not like Moses in his moment of weakness, so anointed, so powerful, and yet he let you go. Um, he didn't show who you really were. He did the work. He did the miracle. But it wasn't how you wanted to be shown. And I don't want to be like that man who also died, who got all those cancers, who was very powerful, anointed, but not reflecting you, and you didn't permit him to live longer on the earth. The Bible says, I remember the scriptures of honor your father and mother, that it be well with you, and you extend your days. We see this, the, the reflection of loving others in terms of our life upon the earth. And I pray that you would give us life. Let us not just honor our mothers and fathers, but bring honor to people. Deal with people out of love. Be accurate reflections. As I messaged in the sermon not too long ago about the fire from heaven, about the judgments that we give, let us be a people that is so merciful that we are not quick to reach for judgment and that we consult you so quickly because you are so patient with us. Let us therefore rather be patient with others. Let us do unto others to treat others how we wish to be treated. In fact, let us treat others better than we wish to be treated. Thank you for guiding us in the word. We love you. We thank you. Please bless the chart room. In Jesus' name, amen.